In ancient times, of course, it uh, was not unusual, and especially in the Middle East, the prostitute was viewed as a kind of a priestess. Hi, I'm Maggie McNeil, and this is The Politics of Sex Work, in which I'm going to give you an overview of why the laws against sex work exist in the first place, where they're going, and why you should be concerned about this. I think a really good place to start is to point out that a lot of people, particularly in the United States, nowadays have a sort of a, a chauvinism, if you will, about sex work in the sense that they think that the way that uh, sex work is looked at today, the way that uh, politicians look at it, the way cops look at it, the way the general public looks at it, is the way it has always been. And I encounter this all the time. Uh, people that think, well, it's always been criminal, hasn't it? Wrong. Uh, in fact, through the greater majority of human history, it wasn't criminalized at all. Um, there's always been a social stigma. Well, always is probably not the right word. There has been for a very long time a social stigma uh, against it. In ancient times, of course, it uh, was not unusual, and especially in the Middle East, to see societies in which the prostitute was viewed as a kind of a priestess. She was seen as a conduit between man and the divine sexual. And so you saw in those days sacred prostitutes actually working in or adjacent to temples. So the prostitute would be basically a priestess of Ishtar, a priestess of Aphrodite. And by paying for sex with her, the man was helping the temple. Uh, she'd get part of it, the temple would get part of it. And the temple provided, of course, uh, you know, a place for her to do it. In a sense, it was the brothel. And she provided for him not just the sex, but also contact with the divine sexual, contact with the goddess. In some of the ancient cultures, especially in Fertile Crescent, we actually saw the prostitute as being a figure who was considered to anoint the king. She actually was the one who bestowed upon the king the ability to be the king. You see this kind of thing in uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. For the most part, the important thing to remember is that this is the background that society in general had when Solon of Athens appears in the scene. Some of you may remember Solon from your classical history. He was the big guy in ancient Greece, right? He was the, the, the wise Solon who was supposed to have uh, launched the golden age of Greece and made everything so wonderful. Well, the problem with Solon is that Solon, like so many uh, politicians, was a control freak. And Solon didn't like the idea that the temples in Athens had so much power, often through, to a degree, uh, through their prostitution, through the sacred prostitution. And so what Solon wanted to do was break the back of the temples. And what he, the way he did this was, in Athens' many wars in the Middle East, he captured a lot of slaves, and he also um, had, he purchased cheap slaves in the Middle East and brought them back to Athens and staffed brothels with them and charged a very, very low amount. Uh, one obol, actually, which was about a half a day's wages for a working man, two, two hours to four hours. And that's really interesting because um, one thing we see in history later, the very least expensive sex work has always been about two hours or so of work of a typical working man. Uh, and that's even true today. Solon set this up and then found to his chagrin that he still wasn't breaking the back of the temples because a lot of guys didn't really want to have a sexual experience with a slave girl who was being forced into it um, and who probably couldn't speak their language that well, couldn't really give them the kind of round experience they wanted. Um, keep this point in mind because it's going to be important a little later. Um, we're going to talk about how the prohibitionists see sex work today. And I think it's important to remember that even in those days when slavery was an accepted part of society, that a lot of men still weren't interested in having sex with a slave. <laughs> 
Solon's campaign sort of failed. Um, the Heteri, the courtesans, still stayed powerful. The street girls still managed to do their business. And so the very first attempt that we know of in Western society of to criminalize or to at least marginalize sex workers kind of failed, kind of fell on its, uh, on its face. After that, what we see is a long series in Roman times, even in the Far East, of attempts to set sex workers apart. There are many thoughts about this, there's many theories about it. We can talk about patriarchal culture. We can talk about uh, governments wanting to, to be able to you know, manage businesses and things like that. Um, the important thing to note is that what they were trying to do is separate in the minds of the public sex workers from other women, to keep them separate, to make them distinct. They weren't really trying to necessarily marginalize sex workers. They weren't trying to push them out of the cities. Um, nobody in those days succumbed to the delusion that society could exist without whores. But the good women didn't want to be mistaken in the street for a hooker. That was basically the, the thing going on there, right? Now what constituted the mistake was a little different in those days than it is now because in those days, very, very often in most societies, and certainly in ancient Greece, in Italy, in the East to some degree, even in the Far East, we see that sex workers tended to be the only women who were actually educated. Most women didn't think that was necessary or their societies wouldn't give it to them, one or the other. Uh, that certainly was true in, in Golden Age Athens, uh, where women didn't even usually learn to read. Whereas the heteri, the courtesans, did, and were educated, and were educated often equally to men. So the important distinction for these folks was not, oh, well, we have to, you know, lock all the whores up, or we have to, to drive them out of society. It was, let's make sure that nobody mistakes the good women for the bad women. There are many different ways of doing this. Um, one of the ways that, that's famous, that's well known, is in Japan, um, they were segregated into districts. In other words, all the sex workers had to be in certain uh, districts, wall districts actually, uh, that were referred to in the typical uh, classical Japanese euphemized fashion as the flower and willow world. This was not really to keep them distinct as much as it was to keep young, samurai from basically uh, cutting up and making a, uh, basically getting drunk in the brothel and, and tearing up everything. Uh, it was as much to protect everybody from, the, from them as it was to, uh, to segregate the sex workers. But in the West, we see a lot of things like, um, for example, sumptuary laws. Um, during one period in Rome, sex workers had to wear yellow if they were out in public. And the senators' wives, that they might be mistaken for otherwise, did not wear yellow. And so basically, by when you saw a woman wearing yellow, okay, you knew she was a sex worker. But the Romans had all sorts of, of things about when you could work and licenses, and they even had two different kinds of sex workers, those who were licensed and those who were not. The ones who were not were referred to by the, to uh, the name uh, prostibuli. And some think that we got our term prostitute from this word. Uh, my Latin's not good enough to, to opine on that. One of my favorites of these um, strange laws to separate uh, sex workers from other women, and there were many of them. Some medieval cities had strange things, even like they had to wear bells on their clothes, or they had to wear uh, a men's, uh, men's hat, or strange things like that. Um, one of my favorite ones is uh, the, La the La Roquette Ordinance uh, in New Orleans, my hometown, um, of the 1860s, I believe it was, which said that you couldn't have a brothel on the first floor of a building. Um, for those who've lived and lived, never lived in New Orleans, this might seem an odd rule until you realize that it's a hot place. And so anything at ground level in the summertime would have the windows open. And the La Roquette Ordinance was intended to protect the tender sensibilities of 
highborn ladies from having to see and hear the sounds and such of a brothel uh, at ground level. So they could have it on the second floor, it was fine. Um, but that's the sort of things that we used to see and we see throughout history. And I think it's, it's important to note this because what you're seeing and what you'll notice is that none of these laws are about shaming sex workers. They're not about forcing us to get out of the profession. They're not about punishing people. They're just about maintaining those social distinctions that people considered so important. That was one lesson from Maggie McNeil's The Politics of Sex Work at Renegade University. You won't find courses like that at places like this. Either in content, or in style, or in courage. To get the full course, go to renegadeuniversity.com. While you're there, you might also be interested in our many courses on American history, philosophy, martial arts, and on how to die. Apart from our very different curriculum, Renegade University is totally different than places like this and all online universities in that every student gets to talk one-on-one -on -one with the instructors. People like Maggie or me or any instructor at RU can talk to you via what we call office hours. Renegade University students and members also talk to each other on our own social media platform. It's our very own. Facebook doesn't control it, Twitter has no say, and the government will never censor it. At Renegade University, you can say, as you might imagine, anything you want to say. Right now, for a limited time, you can get 30 to 40% off everything at the brand new RU. Go to renegadeuniversity.com or just click the links below in the description.